All right, let's do this one last time. Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse is the greatest animated film of 2018 and possibly one of the best of all time. It's a unique cinematic masterpiece blending new and experimental forms of animation and rendering on a large scale. And today I wanted to look at what we specialize here on this channel, the character design of Into the Spider-Verse. And hopefully you've seen the movie already because spoilers are ahead. Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse isn't a movie about the person Spider-Man. It's about the idea of Spider-Man. What makes you different Let's go. is what makes you Spider-Man. That's why in this film, it's so equally important to show what is Spider-Man and what isn't Spider-Man. Of course, longtime comic fans know the difference between Spider-Ham, Spider-Gwen, and who could forget Spider's Man, the large assembly of small spiders masquerading as one of us. But to the average movie-going public, the distinction between the classic eight live-action films and counting iconic Peter Parker Spider-Man and each new Spider-Person needs to be clear. The Chris Pine-voiced opening sequence Peter Parker is that one that's familiar to audiences. Very obviously, he is Spider-Man, at least our baseline or starting position. This Peter is on the older side, he's experienced, he's muscular but still slender, and much of his movement, especially later during the scenes versus Green Goblin, is calm, confident, almost lackadaisical. I am so tired. Our first variant is Peter B. Parker. He is Spider-Man from maybe the rib cage up. But notice that once he's in Miles' universe, the distinction is very clear. Peter B. isn't Spider-Man, at least by our argument, because he wears sweatpants, is heavier set, sports five o'clock shadow, and is typically missing a shoe. His movements are decidedly more off-kilter and comedic than the original Peter. And it's so important that these distinctions are made, not just so that the audience isn't confused, but so that they also understand that this movie isn't about replacing the original Peter Parker with a new one. It could be so easy to accidentally convey that Peter Parker is the one and true, only correct Spider-Man, which he isn't. In our movie's case, Miles is also the Spider-Man that we want to focus on. And so each new Spider-Person that's introduced isn't set up as inferior to the original. Spider-Woman, or Spider-Gwen, or Gwanda, whatever you want to call her, has one of the greatest recent costume designs in comics. She is Spider-Man through a familiar costume design, including the eyes, but she isn't Spider-Man through the addition of a hood, which not only creates an interesting negative space effect, but also gives the idea that her character is sheltered and closed off. Her movements and animation is probably the most nimble of the other spider people, combined with the marks alluding to tied-on ballet shoes on her feet and legs, and very ballerina-esque movements. Gwen is competent, but obviously still deeply affected by the loss of her Peter Parker. What I appreciated so much is that the final moments between her and Miles have them becoming friends. And that's significant because she's decided not to make friends out of fear of being hurt. Opening herself up to a friendship is a big deal to her, but it shows growth that she's able to trust Miles. The film could have easily had the two characters kiss instead, but the way the moment played out made Gwen a fully realized character in a believable scenario, and not just a romantic achievement unlocked for Miles. Next up is the coolest, most intimidating threat this film sees, Prowler. His hood shape descending from the chin instead of form-fitting the neck shows that he isn't Spider-Man, despite having costuming and shape language that's relatively similar. Prowler has parkour abilities and gauntlets that stick to walls and send out shocks. These are traits that are passed down thematically to Miles' Spider-Man, if you notice the resemblance. The pointy shapes in his cowl and cape are not only signifiers of a villain, but I'd like to speculate that it's a bit of a nod to his work for Kingpin, Prowler being a crown of sorts among his lackeys. That's purely speculation, however. Now on to Penny Parker and Spider, the Noir Spider-Man, and Spider-Ham. I've seen some people say they would have liked to see more of these characters in the movie, but I appreciate that any more focus on them would have detracted from Miles' story. Spider-Ham is Spider-Man because he has the same costuming and colors, but he isn't because he's a drastically different shape and size. When it comes to the aspect of the original Spider-Man that he best accentuates, I can't tell you there's something in-universe, but maybe it's the kitsch value of things like the old Spider-Man TV shows. 
a reminder not to take all things Spider-Man so seriously, similar to the iconic Adam West Batman. One of the very few negative opinions I've seen of this movie was someone saying that there were too many jokes. They wanted their superhero stories to be more serious. Uh, those stories are out there for you. Sorry if uh, we were all having too much fun with this one. I was actually confused in some of the showings I was in. Uh, the people around me were actually either chuckling or laughing at the death of Spider, treating the way that it paid homage to an Eastern storytelling drama as a sort of parody. And even though its consciousness survives, the shell is a vestige of Penny's lost father. Penny and Spider is or are Spider-Man because of the coloring, the movement, and aren't Spider-Man because of the shape language and the split into a duo. Penny is not wearing her own spider suit because she's a regular human without the mech, and wearing some kind of suit may have had us confused about her spider capability. Penny accentuates the original Peter Parker's advanced technological abilities, easily crafting another goober. And she wears Heelys. Did Peter Parker ever wear Heelys? He should. A tiny detail that I appreciate is that given the way that Spider's limbs are connected by a sort of holographic webbing, their flips in the air resemble a spider that's wrapping up its prey in web. Do you see the resemblance? I think that's pretty cool. Noir is Spider-Man through familiar eye shapes and capabilities like web swinging, but obviously isn't Spider-Man because of not only his lack of color, but extra costuming. He accentuates the strength and hand-to-hand -hand combat that the original Spider-Man had. His animation has an extra sense of old-fashioned bravado. A lot of extra work was done to keep Noir well-defined, crisp, and highly contrast on screen visually, so that he read well despite being monochromatic. Miles' dad is an incredible character design. Shi Yoon Kim did an amazing job of creating interesting, unique, stylized shapes that still easily resemble human anatomy, and have distinct shapes depending on the angle you look at them. Following the story from the perspective of Miles' family only, and his influences, he begins the story torn between his dad's path of pushing him to be better and his uncle's enabling nature. There's dissonance in what Miles wants to do. And as sad as the loss of Aaron is, it acts as a unifying measure, not only motivating Miles to bring justice to the Kingpin externally, but internally healing the rift with his father, finally empowering him to become Spider-Man in earnest. Kingpin is the perfect example of why making an animated version of a property is so liberating. Instead of being restrained by the confines of what a typical human can reach in shape and size, Kingpin is exaggerated, gigantic, and a brute force. And even though Kingpin is an existing Spider-Man villain, it resonates well that the main antagonist at a film about an inner-city minority is a white wealthy capitalist. Kingpin's motive is well-defined, and it's done so economically. We come to not only fear him, but pity him. We know full well that it wasn't Spider-Man, but him that was at fault for his family. And given the variety of Spider-People that we know aren't Spider-Man, whoever he would theoretically bring through that portal successfully just wouldn't be the same as those that he lost. And as for anyone saying that Kingpin doesn't work because he wouldn't look right in real life... Stop it. Get some help. Olivia Octavius, absolutely perfect. Great character, great surprise reveal, great octopus-esque hairstyling. We have a refreshing take on the Doc Ock arms, resembling advanced medical biotechnology, kind of like those 3D printed hearts. I think one of the advantages of this being an animated film is that the arms were freed up to do a lot more. Even shots where the arms are frantically running around, but she's perfectly stationary in the middle, are a great stylistic effect. This is a movie that uses repetition in a way that never gets tiring. We start over one last time from the beginning, over and over, but it never gets old. We see something familiar, but we get a fresh spin on it. Just like Miles, our new Spider-Man. I love the hoodie, shorts, and sneakers version of Miles because it's so down to earth. Without the mask, it's something I'd be 100% comfortable wearing out and about. It's relatable. As for the suit on its own, the spray-painted spider is great, but my favorite costume design choice is the two red stripes that act like fangs coming down from each shoulder. Not only do these accents give a sense of masculine, shoulder-broadening strength, 
the kind of thing that a skinny teen boy might want to draw attention to. Miles' version of Spider-Man has the Venom Strike ability, so it makes total sense that the spider's fangs are a feature of his costume. Miles also has the power to go invisible, and while I don't think that's directly referenced in his costume, at least the black color is reminiscent of, say, stealth planes, which tend to come in a matte black. When it comes to character design, it's not necessary for every element to be showcased in the costuming or design, but it's always nice when it's there. Overall, I love how unapologetic Into the Spider-Verse is. So many universes are brought together in a way that's unified, but not homogenized. It stylistically hits a sort of blending point halfway between, say, any other animation project with consistent style and composition, and not quite the jarring variants of something like The Amazing World of Gumball. The variables are all mixed together with amazing tricks like depth of field blur that uses chromatic aberration instead of a traditional lens, textures pulled straight from the printing presses of old comics, animation being done on twos like traditional hand-drawn work instead of smoothing in between frames, repeated elements to indicate motion instead of blurs or tweens, the excellent glitch effects, the great translation of Kirby Crackle in motion, the line art overlapping elements like faces to get clearer expressions, the fact that literally every frame of this movie is something you can pause and appreciate on its own. Combined with things that we didn't really talk about, like a fantastic script, genuinely fresh humor, an amazing set of sound effects, and a tight original score and soundtrack, I hope that Into the Spider-Verse has set a new bar, not just for creatives to strive for, but for companies and studios to see and encourage making more of. It's a film that I deeply care about, and I hope it's one that you not only learn from, but are inspired by.